Hello and welcome to the first edition of season three of the CEBL show. I'm your host, Sean Woodley. Thank you so much for joining me here on the only podcast dedicated to covering the Canadian Elite Basketball League. Uh, it's a big year. We got a lot of exciting stuff coming this year on the podcast. We've got Amy Otterbert, who was doing a wonderful, just absolutely godlike sideline reporting last year at the CEBL bubble. She will be taking part in this podcast throughout the season. Very excited to have Amy as a regular contributor. We got some big fun stuff video content wise that we should maybe not tease just yet while we've sorted out the details, but it's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, let's start things off this year on the podcast with, I think it's now a rite of passage is the first podcast of the year. We have to talk to the head honcho, the boss man of the Canadian Elite Basketball League. It's Mike Morreale with me to kick things off. Mike, how are you, man? I'm, I'm good. I, I can't believe, first of all, I'm honored to be your first guest uh, on a yearly <laughs> basis. And uh, secondly, I cannot believe we're going into year three. I, honestly, it's been, I mean, most of us have been sitting at home for a year. So it's been a bit of a, a whirlwind. Uh, we managed to pull off a season and hopefully we're going to do that again this year. Yeah, so before we take a look at this coming season, Mike, I want to sort of get your thoughts. We haven't spoken since the end of the CEBL Summer Series back in, I guess it was like July, August? What, who, yeah. what is time? Who knows? But, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, that went off, I think, as well as you could have hoped for. I'm curious, sort of, what was the response from people within the league, players within the league? And then beyond that, you know, what have you started to hear from people outside of the league? This is a question I'm always fascinated to ask you because the league will grow if there is sort of buzz about it and people who are thinking, hey, I want to be a part of that. That looked like a lot of fun. What's so? I guess start first with sort of the general like inside the league reaction to how things went down, and then go a little bit bigger with you know what are people outside of the league saying about what happened with the summer series last year? Well, I, I mean the summer series for us was a, a you know a big investment into returning to play. Um, being able to be the first league to do that was fantastic, but it was also completely stressful and emotional and the rest of it. But you know our our commitment to returning and the the safety measures we put in place and and getting the players on board and the coaches on board, et cetera, was, you know, our first big win. Uh, you know, that trust that they put in you to, to put on an event, especially at that point uh, in the pandemic when it was still like high level alert, people weren't jaded at that point yet. Right. So mm -hmm. um, getting all those, everybody together and to run that efficiently, especially based on it, Sean, you know how we operate. We're not a big organization, but we're a mighty organization. People like to pull their weight. So um, from a player and coach perspective, they bought right in. I think I know that they were they were happy with the opportunity to play. And I, I think, again, it just endeared ourselves to our biggest asset, which is the players. It's really important, especially the type of quality of players that we, we look to bring in and have brought in that we, we take care of them. Um, that, that's important from a from a staff point of view, from a league point of view. I mean, it was a great accomplishment to pull that off. Um, like I said, it was quite intense. We learned a heck of a lot along the way, how to deal with government, how to deal with public health. We're going through it again right now as we're getting ready for 2021. That's always the fun part. Um, <laughs> but that sense of accomplishment is like, is massive because, you know, if the people and not just league office, everybody across the league chipped in and contributed and were part of something that very few people could do. So that was great. From a fan perspective and an awareness perspective, it was through the roof. So, mm -hmm. You know, you can imagine we, 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 the latter half of 2019, we did a deal with CBC to pick up our games on gym, right. On, on just the digital side, the live stream side. And it was really good. I mean, we got awareness that we didn't have before. It was a great platform for us. It led us to signing our deal late 2019 for, a, for a more profound relationship, which we currently have. And we turned that into, you know, seven live games over four days. Uh, plus the other 19 games were, were streamed not only domestically, but internationally. Our live games were domestic and international. Uh, we had over 1.2 million people tune in over those four days. So that's really encouraging when you look up coming from nothing. Um, and we had a, a massive reach out in Southeast Asia and Australia and other places um, and Twitch as well. So we really kind of, uh, you know, were forced in some ways to invest into that side of the business because there are no fans. That investment has continued. We can kind of get into what things we're, we're announcing, have announced, and we're going to unveil this year on, on the video side, on the content side for us. Um, but the big thing for me was hearing from people in the basketball circles outside of the CBL. So, yeah. you know, it's a very tight knit community, but I don't get to see everybody all the time. And certainly with the pandemic, you don't get those touch points. So 
just hearing from them that they were able to turn on a TV and be able to see people they grew up with or knew about or lost contact with when they went to, you know, the NCAA or overseas and to say, wow, this looks like good. Uh, so the production, production level is high. The awareness was through the roof. Uh, it's really catapulted us in many ways as we get ready for 2021. So overall, the experience was was awesome. It was a return on investment 10 times, but it was uh, something I hope I never have to do again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, as part of the broadcast team, which I, I hope there were nice comments about that. Maybe yes. that was the one area where there was negative feedback is get that idiot with the beard and glasses off my TV. Um, but no, I, it, it was... You know, it was really well executed. I felt safe the entire time, which I was not. I was a little skeptical of, honestly. Yep. You know, I'm a big uh, pandemic scared boy. And to have a level of comfort like that was really, really nice. And the basketball was incredible. I had a ton of fun. The Elam ending coming in was awesome. Mm-hmm. And I, I know that's coming back this year. Uh, a lot of a lot of fun there. Um, I guess you mentioned the investment that it was, Mike, and the yeah. risk, I guess, that it was because, you know, you don't know that you don't have fans. You know, how are you going to put yourselves in the hole too much by putting this thing on? But it's really interesting. And I mean, you spent a lot of time in the CFL. I'm kind of curious in sort of the way the two leagues have approached the pandemic differently. The CFL seems to want to put off playing as long as possible until they can get fans back and seem kind of averse to the idea of playing without fans and finding other revenue streams whereas like you said i mean there was the twitch there was the cbc exposure you know i think the cebl did everything it could to get itself out there even in an adverse situation it was the first league back and i I guess i'm curious for you like you know obviously it worked for you guys and it worked for the league but having spent time in the cfl you know why was the decision to go ahead and play a season and make sure you're just there fans or not why was that the call for you in a way that it has not been for the CFL? And I think they're probably going to hurt themselves for it in the long run. Yeah. I mean, obviously it's a little out of school for me to talk about the decision-making on the CFL, but I, but I can certainly tell you why it was important to us. So last year there was, you know, again, we're coming off great momentum. Saskatchewan winning the the championship in their home market at the end of the year, signing that deal with CBC, announcing Ottawa, 75 new players and everything ramping up to a, a tremendous uh, second season and then you know stuff hits the fan and you got to reevaluate so I think no different than last year uh, this year you know the direction from me is we are going to return to play and if there's fans fantastic we want as many fans as possible but we can't uh, you know hinge our decision on whether or not fans are in the stands now other leagues may take a different approach we are built a little bit differently. We have centralized kind of administration. We can make a decision today and go. There's not a lot of, I don't have to ask permission per se. Um, Mm -hmm. Other leagues are built differently, especially in North America. So, you know, um, when we make the decision to go forward, we're all in and we're all in on 2021, but you have to take away the barriers. So if one of the barriers is revenue, We've been living with this for a year. We haven't made any significant revenue for a a solid year coming up in about 10 or 12 days. So Mm -hmm. that is not a position we're comfortable with. But, you know, for us being, you know, a startup, let's say, um, this is an investment in the future. So we're willing to make these investments because we know where we're going. And I think our plan is, you know, future based. Other leagues live in the moment and it's hard to make decisions sometimes in the moment. I have to look years and years ahead with the understanding that that Richard is is funding this thing in its entirety. So you have to be careful, but we also have to make, uh, you know, we have to make injections of capital. We have to make commitments and we have to make improvements like we are with our OTT platform and new content and more content and, and looking for new teams, et cetera. So uh, it, we haven't stopped. And we won't stop. People ask me all the time, my friends, hey, like, do you, do you do anything in the off season? I say, are you? <laughs> I, it's time. The basketball season is the fun time. We can actually get back and let the other people do the work. But uh, you have to, I, I think you have to have a singular goal that you drive towards because I need to lead and my team needs to understand and trust in my decisions. And they have. And it's paid off. And I hope I continue to make good decisions. I'm sure I'll make a bonehead decision. <laughs> and, and maybe I have. I don't know. But, uh, you know, we're going to move forward in, in what's best for the league, in not just now, but into the future. Yeah, I can't imagine 
you know, the decision to play is not going to have long-term helpful effects just for the awareness of the league. I mean, especially considering it was the second season of the league. You can't right. really go silent for a year after only having one season. The CFL has a little bit more historical leeway, right. I, I guess like 150 times more <laughs> historical leeway if we're going on a year basis. But um, you mentioned that you've been busy as hell in the off season, Mike. Let's kind of maybe recap some of the things that CEBL fans maybe missed over the course of the offseason. Of course, free agency is going strong. We're going to dive into free agency in the coming weeks so you can stay away from the player personnel side of yep, things. Yep. But in terms of the league, you know, we've got the schedule announced, a 14-game schedule reduced from 20 starting in June. Um, we've They're going to be traveling, playing in their own arenas, which is very exciting. Uh, and then you've got Montreal. What's going on there? There's lots of stuff yep. kicking around, lots of noise and uh, sort of illusions. Uh, what's been the offseason for you, Mike, and sort of what are the big biggest things that uh, you were working on that maybe CBL fans are going to see very soon here. Yeah, I, I think, you know, obviously structurally getting ready for the season, that part, which, which we've kind of unveiled through our schedule, um, the OTT platform, which some people are like, what is OTT? It took me a long time to figure that out. It's over the top. Uh, Same here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'll give you the brief kind of what it is. So the best way to do is relate it to other platforms that are similar. So Disney plus Netflix, the zone, they just basically become, you know, uh, content places you go for content. And in yeah. our case, we wanted to establish a place where not only can you come there for all the CBL live action or on demand action or podcasts or behind the scenes and broken up by team, broken up by league. It allows us to go uh, all over the world. Uh, we will remain free in Canada. I think it's the right thing to do. We certainly still have our, our uh, deal with CBC in place. So we're going to have more outlets to watch what we do and different ways to watch what we do. So that's really important. Um, you know, free agency tipped off. But we got now the second kind of round of free agency that started March 2nd. Now it's open season. And I already know that uh, this is your little hint. There will be uh, players that are switching teams. So contracts mm -hmm. are in the door. They aren't, some of them aren't announced yet or signed yet, but there would be some movement and there'll be some similarity. So I think, you know, it's nice to see some of the teams pulling in, out some little tricks to get some, you know, good <laughs> players moving. That's always encouraging. And it's always great to see a core group of people remain because I think, you know, you want some of that consistency. As it relates to Montreal, that that's a market we've been working on for quite some time. And we're still working on it on the finer details of going. Mm -hmm. I, I've made the commitment publicly. We will be there in 2022. That doesn't mean I have a signed lease at the moment where we're working through that <laughs> particular deal. So I'm not I'm not jumping the gun. Uh, there will be a formal announcement when everything's tied up in a bow. But it's important mm -hmm. for me in my position to explain, you know, to potential investors or other, you know, potential owners or just fans in general that this league is on the move and it's on the move in the right direction. And this is where our vision is and this is where we're going. So that commitment's real. Uh, we will be there. We've already hired uh, our first staff member to look uh, after Montreal, Andy LaRouche, uh, who's a very well-decorated, well-respected, uh, long-term um, sports executive out of Montreal. That was met with, you know, I, I can tell you, my LinkedIn profile from that day got about all these people with French last names are just <laughs> trying to team me up. So uh, that's not a bad thing. Um, but, you know, and that continues our growth into opening the market in Quebec city or, or further East. And, and we still have to fill the gaps in places like Vancouver and Calgary and, and Winnipeg, et cetera. And, and maybe a team or two more in Ontario. So mm -hmm. right at this point in time, I am, I don't want to say juggling because I, you know, but there's a groups of people that are showing very serious interest in not only the teams, but in the league in general. And that goes to all the hard work that we did to kind of create and, and continue to create what we, uh, what we have in front of us. So Montreal, again, no, nothing is hard and fast. Again, no lease signed or anything like that. But clearly you've been looking at it, as you said. Why is Montreal an attractive market to you? Is it just, is it Lugans Dort and nothing else? <laughs> you gotta, gotta capitalize on the Dort train? Um, no, but honestly, like, why is Montreal the, the next place for the CEBL to you? Uh, there's a few reasons. Uh, there's the obvious reasons that they are graduating some of the top players, Canadian players to the NBA or to the NCAA. You just look at the numbers and how... Uh, Quebec, the whole province is kind of caught up to maybe Ontario and BC and in some cases surpassed them. So there's, there's a good base there for, for basketball, but even the grassroots level is very, very good. It's a, it's a great city, right? It's a culturally significant city. It's a cool city. It's one that supports its sports, sports teams. It's one that supports its sports people. 
So, you know, spending my time spent in Quebec, uh, you know, playing in the CFL, I, you got to see the real engagement from fans and businesses and everybody around their own athletes. They really, really take care of all sports, Olympic, CFL, you name it. So that's encouraging when you're looking at a market. Um, it's, it's a market that is, to, to my point earlier, cool and hip and funky. And, and it likes to do, you know, I think basketball fits quite nice. But it's also a market that over the last couple of years has been tuning in to the CBL. So we get, we know the numbers, we see the social media followings, we know where people come from. So that natural organic growth without having a team there is, is important. And there's other markets that are, that are doing similar things. So, you know, you combine that with a, uh, the fact that we have, you know, half dozen players, you know, over a dozen people, including coaches, et cetera, that already participate in the CBL and have one point have a, maybe more than a dozen have come through Quebec or born in Quebec or played in the university system there. There's a good base of people. Um, and we've seen quite, uh, you know, it, it quickly and it profoundly that they want to support this team and mm -hmm. we're excited about going there. I'm excited to uh, make trips to Montreal to cover games. Hopefully. We all are. Fingers crossed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so the season, uh, like I said, the schedule's been announced. 14 games starting in June. Uh, shortened season, the, the machinations are going to be that they're playing in their own arenas. Uh, mm -hmm. As it stands right now, that's the plan. Obviously, local health authorities will have the final say on that type of thing, but... What went into the decision to start a little bit later than the May, uh, typical start time? I guess tip, it's been one year we've started in May, and then the right. other year was a bubble. So <laughs> maybe yeah. it's not typical. But um, you know, what's the decision in shortening the season a little bit there? What goes into that call? And uh, sort of what can CBL fans expect from the way the season is going to sort of play out this summer? Yeah, so the decision to push back is really just buying time. Um, mm -hmm. And also considering that uh, some of the European leagues and other leagues that our players play in have, have stalled at times over the last year and they get delayed a bit. And there's still a, a chance that some of those players may not be available till July. That's mm -hmm. okay. We've built a system where we have a lot of players. The player mm -hmm. is not Players are not our problem in terms of finding talent. And, and we built a system in terms of being able to add and subtract players throughout the year you know, if they're delayed coming, that doesn't affect the team in a negative way. So, um, you know, we're, we have a hard stop on the back end because, you know, around that August 22nd is when our championship game is currently scheduled for, um, you know, shortly after that, our players go back overseas. And so we have to be, you know, mindful of that time. And we also understand that we looked around in every other sport and they're all play, returning, but they're returning in a condensed way, a little bit of a different way. So we felt you know, here's a time to, we've gone from a 20 game to a six game plus playoffs back to a 14 game. We're just trying to get back closer to some normalcy, but without overextending. And um, time is, is our biggest, you know, advocate on this side. Um, you know, the players are, are excited to get back. And I, I think fans will see a, a really, uh, whether they see it in person or they see it through their TV set or mobile phone or whatever, uh, they're going to see a lot of intensity. A lot of these players, uh, again, have, you know, um, lost the opportunity to make more money than usual because of shortened condensed seasons. Uh, they don't, aren't playing as much basketball. Look at the bubble in the G League, right? They went from a 50 game season down to a 15. Um, mm -hmm. So access to players, I think, is, is going to be tremendous. Um, and, and we're seeing that already. And then, you, you know, the, the fans are going to see the continuation and the growth of our game. And I think the CBL style of game is unlike most other leagues. It's a very transitional, mm -hmm. fast game. You know, most of our guys are in that six, eight, six, nine and, and athletic. We don't have a ton of seven foot plus and the ones that do are, are, are good, but they're, there's not a ton of them. And that may change over time as we bring in more internationals and we bring in more, uh, you know, from overseas or also from the U S but uh, they're going to see the best basketball played in this country outside the NBA. That's what they're going to see. Uh, and they're going to see it played by predominantly almost all Canadians. Yeah. Um, so on that note of the Canadian players and the Canadian contingent and the growing pool of players in the national team system, you know, there's a bit of a wrench thrown into the summer this year, it seems, with the Olympics and the FIBA qualifiers. And like the NBA is like moving hell and high water or not moving anything. I don't know, yeah. to make sure they're done in time to get to the Olympics. And so maybe we'll see a full complement of NBA players in that qualifier in Victoria mm -hmm. uh, late June, early July. 
But maybe we don't. Maybe the, I don't know, the Denver Nuggets go deep and Jamal Murray's not available. Yep. Maybe, uh, you know, guys realize we just played 72 games in like four months. We need a rest and we're not going over to the Olympics. Are you expecting, penciling in sort of the expectation of maybe losing some guys from the CEBL pool to that qualifier and potentially the Olympic team? And if that happens, is that a bummer for you considering that they're leaving the league or is that actually sort of a feather in the cap of, Hey, we have these national teamers that are now playing in the Olympics or the Olympic qualifiers that come straight from our league. I, I think it's a feather in the cap. We've always uh, proclaimed that we want to be a stepping stone for bigger and better things or a, a place that our, you know, our current existing pros can showcase their talent. So you look at the America cup that just happened. We had, I think 10 or 11 players that at one point in time played in the CBL. Mm -hmm. um that's encouraging to us right that we can be a bit of a pipeline now they play elsewhere as well but you know they're homegrown talent so that's important uh depending on you know how deep certain teams go into the playoffs for the nba uh raptors are i think regular season is on may 16th so you you expect about every every couple of weeks it will be a round right so mm -hmm. it within a month let's say we'll get through two rounds we're about the middle of june um, you know, the, the OQs in Victoria go, I think the end of June, June 29th, yeah, 29th. right. Yeah. So, you know, there's a bit of a buffer there for, for people. I think we're, we're going to have better talent we've ever had in, in, uh, in terms of the Olympic team. Um, I also think we're going to lose a few guys and that's not a bad thing. Uh, we're going to, we're going to praise those guys and lift them up and, and support them. Uh, not only because they're Canadian, but because they're members of the CBL and we really want to do that. So, um, you know, the, the interesting part about the qualifiers is that the turnaround's pretty tight, right? So I think you want to build that camaraderie. So it'll be mm -hmm. interesting to see, you know, there's been a lot of public, uh, you know, talks about the commitments last year going into Tokyo uh, and, and a great handful of the best stars, you know, from the NBA. But there are a ton of guys that can fill in from the NCAA or can fill in from the top leagues in France and, and Germany and wherever, so I, I think it's going to be a balance, and I think that team will change. The makeup of that team will change, and and stay tuned. We're we're looking to to announce stuff where we you know can help um, with with the national team in one way, shape, or form, and and that'll be coming uh, another one of the future kind of uh, hints that we'll have as we get closer to the season. I love the hints. I love the teasers, Mike. Do you have any other teasers or hints before we wrap up here? <laughs> stuff that, you know, don't get into the details. Just give the people the little nugget that uh, something's coming down the pipe here. Or maybe we've already gone through all the teasers. I don't know. Well, I, I think for, for me, you know, from a, I think the where this league is heading uh, and where where we've come from and where we're going is, is going to be really special. Um, the, the groups that I'm talking to, the individuals that I'm talking to, they see the value in the CBL. They see the value in the sport. They realize how, how important basketball is to um, the culture of the community uh, and people want to participate in it. So I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to share more information as we get closer to the season into the season about new and exciting partnerships and, and new owners and all this stuff. Um, but the game plan right now is to bounce that ball on June 5th and, uh, <laughs> and take it from there. We're super excited, Mike. Uh, we'll continue to cover all the news and developments as the season draws near here on the CEBL show. We'll get into free agency coming up in a couple of weeks. Amy Otterbert's going to stop by for her first appearance as a regular contributor on the podcast. Uh, until then, Mike, thank you so much, man. It was lovely catching up with you, and uh, hopefully we talk soon. I would like to see you in person soon. I don't nice. know when the hell that's going to happen, but yeah, hopefully very soon. <laughs> Sounds good, Sean. Appreciate it, buddy. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. We will talk to you again in two weeks' time with Free Agency Talk here on the CEBL Show. Have a good one, everybody.